Hi Mike. Hi, how are you doing? How are you doing? Good, bro. Salama bana. Yeah, nice how are you? to have you here. Thank you so much it's for Father's, inviting us. It's Father's Day. Yeah. Mut let a guest up. Mut let a guest. I let him introduce himself. Hi. Hi, my name is Jason. Yes, Jason. How are you doing? I'm good. You're well. You're having fun today. Yeah. You're celebrating your dad. Are you sure? That's so good. Jason, yeah. I need to look at the camera. And I need to tell our audience mm -hmm. um, what you want to be when you grow up. Okay. So I would like to be a scientist. I want to solve I want to solve world problems and end hunger and help poor people. Lovely. <laughs> I love that. And he's also a YouTuber. Yeah, you're also a YouTuber. Yeah, wow. yeah. Tell, tell, tell the viewers your YouTube channel. Yeah. My YouTube channel is called The Adventures of Jason Washira. Go over there and subscribe and hit the notification bell. Yeah, we'll have the link down in the description. And lovely guests we have here. Okay, absolutely. And this is uh, so as part of Father's Day, you know. Uh, here's proof I'm a father, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> you can see we look. <laughs> do, 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 do we look alike? People say we look alike. I don't know. Just, okay. with, just with hair. <laughs> I used to have dreads at some point. Yeah, really? Yeah, I used to have dreads at some point. So he's always clowning me about my pictures oh. uh, with, with, with the dreadlocks. Yeah. And so we decided, yeah, why not? Let's, uh, it's a good look on him as well. Yeah, it really is. Actually. Yeah. It gives him character. Yeah, it does. It does. Should I, should I grow my dreads again? <laughs> so today you guys are shopping? Yeah. You're ready to make him go broke? Oh, yeah? Yes. He already knows the money. Finish all the money. He has finish all the money. What, all of it. What's the what's the first store you want to go to? Uh, what is it called? Toizuna. Toy yeah, yeah. Oh, that's where all the money is ending. The <laughs> that's where all the, what do you want to get? Everything. You can't get everything. You have to pick I one can't. thing. What? If you combine our money, we can. Oh. Okay. Well, well, okay. So your savings plus mine. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay. We right. get everything. All right. Cool. We'll see what we can get. I just Mike. Wanna win. Mm. Mike. Yes, sir. If you know me, mm -hmm. there's nothing I enjoy more in this world yeah. than having conversations with people like you, mm -hmm. people who've trailblazed, yeah. people who've pushed through all their passion points. Yeah. They've explored everything, mm -hmm. and none more remarkably than you. Ah, oh, thank you're, you, thank you. I appreciate you're that. You're a husband. Yeah. You're a father. Clearly. Yeah. Um, there's proof. <laughs> <laughs> there's proof. <laughs> um, you're a radio presenter. Yeah. TV presenter. Yeah. You are an MC. Yeah. You're a DJ. Yeah. You're also a humanitarian lawyer. Yeah. How do? You, how are you able to do all these things together in a span of a career that has taken you 13 years? Yeah, about 13 years. Well, actually, it's more because the, the work I do for human rights law I've done for about 17 so years that now. So started a lot earlier. So yeah, that started a lot earlier. Yeah. But uh, things like DJing and those, I mean, I've, I've been a DJ since 1997. <laughs> and I don't look it, eh? but yeah, my name is Who was DJing then? <laughs> were they equipment? But no, I mean, those, look, I, when I started DJing, we were, we were DJing with cassettes. Then we went to turntables, then we went to CDs, then we went to, you know, everything else that you see now. So me, when I began, I began from... Started from the bottom, now we're here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, that's Ogopa days. Yeah, not even before Ogopa days, man. That's like way, way, way back. Hey, way, man. way back. Oh, gee. Oh, gee. Those days it was Pinye and uh, Gitch Boy and um, a couple of other people who were doing. Yeah, that's before Codred. Yeah, man. that's way before Codred, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's lovely. Yeah. And then that brought you into. So, how did. Law, because you did your law degree outside Kenya. Yeah, I did my law degree in India, so that's actually even where I learned how to DJ. Mm -hmm. But that's also where I learned, uh, you know, a lot of things about being independent. Because I was out of the country mm -hmm. at a very young age, at about 19. So that's mm -hmm. why I learned how to be independent, how to hustle, how to pursue those passion points that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I surrounded myself with people who had the same kind of vision that I did. Yeah. And so it was really important for me to be able to be in that environment where I yeah. could you know, pursue my talents yeah. and turn them into skills that pay the bills. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's brilliant. Yeah. And so and so for me, I mean it's not been too difficult to balance all those things. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think also because of the way my mind works, I'm able to do you know, people 
and, and I always say this, people who've got ADHD, it's attention deficit disorder. Now mine was att attention deficit hyper disorder. You know. Also you have yeah. both inattentiveness. So, yeah, inattentiveness. So so also. in class I was a terrible student in class. Yeah. I was as unable to sit and yeah. listen to le you know lecture style sort of classroom. Yeah. You know where the teacher is just talking at you for eight hours. I couldn't do that. Systemic structure. Yeah. You know very structured. So for people who are creative, it's finding very difficult in those sorts of formal settings. Yeah. Unless you're doing something creative, yeah. you've been given a problem to solve yeah. where you can apply your creativity and your mind. Yeah. And that's why I say the education system in Kenya fails people like us. Yeah. So it's not us who fail education, it's the education yeah. that fails us. Fails because us, yeah. they don't have the type of environment where creatives can thrive. But then I got to understand, I became very self-aware quite early. Mm -hmm. And I got to understand that um, I have other things that I can do which make me just as great as that person who got 99 in maths yeah you know and yeah. so when i understood that then i started exploring what are these talents that i have i could i used to draw i could do fine art mm -hmm. um at some point i was i even tried rapping yeah, yeah. How did that like, go? Oh, the boys, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Are there tapes? Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> thank god there are none um then you know i got into djing i got then from there it was just progressive you know once you've understood yourself and the talents that you have, it's not just up to you to understand how to completely explode them yeah. and explore them to the fullest. Yeah. yeah. When did you know you have ADHD? I think when I was in when I was in college is where I, where I discovered it. Yeah. So were you diagnosed? No, no, I wasn't diagnosed, but you know I could see all this. I mean, when yeah. I then started doing research about it, yeah. I could tick off all the boxes. Ah, yeah, yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. This, this yeah. is the thing. Yeah. yeah. Then, I, but then I got to understand that my inability to be able to focus on very formal, mundane, administrative things. Yeah. Um, while some might look at it as a handicap, I chose yeah. to look at it as. A um, as a strength, as a superpower, as a superpower, because what does that mean? It means that I'm able to focus very, very well on creative things, yeah, and I can do that for a long time. And you hyper focus, and actually. I'm hyper focused on creative things, mm. and then I can do multiple creative things mm. without getting burnt mm. out or tired. Mm. So then I started asking myself, okay, good, if I'm good at focusing on creative things, mm. why don't I look for many creative things that I can do? and which can earn me money so yeah. i use my passion and my talents yeah. turn them into skills yeah and then i can uh, have that work for me yeah so then i said realizing oh you know um i can do my human rights law from eight to five mm -hmm. then from five to another hour i could do something else and mm. so on and so forth so as a matter of fact when i first began mm. uh this was in 2002 yeah. When I joined Kenya School of Law here, yeah. I was earning 5,000 shillings a month. It was nothing because I was doing pupillage, like yeah. our, our attachment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was earning 5,000 bob a month, so I couldn't live off that. Yeah. So that's when I started DJing in a club where I was earning six times that amount. And then, so I used to work from, from 8 to 5. And then at 8 p.m. I start DJing until 1 a.m. So then I asked myself, between 5 when I leave the office, and eight when I start DJing, I can do something in the middle there. Yeah. So that's what I started thinking. Maybe I can get a radio show yeah. to fill in that gap and earn some money and there. You, and you applied straight. E exactly. So one day I was sitting in the office and I was flipping through the Friday newspaper and they, they had the Pulse magazine. Yeah. And this is 2007. And then I saw Homeboys, yeah. ra Homeboys were starting a radio station. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, uh, maybe I should go try. And then when I went to audition... And a lot of, of people were auditioning. Oh, when I got there, there were like a thousand guys in the car park. And I was like, oh my God. I'm going to wait for all these guys. Like, this is going to be too much. And then God works in very mysterious ways. And I always tell people. So one of the directors of uh, Homeboys at that time is called Alfra Ba. Alfra Ba lived in the same block where my mom lived. Mm. And so even before... I went to do the audition. I already knew Alf because I'd see him around mm. the, the, the neighborhood. Mm. So he'd come out, we'd talk and we'd mm. chat and be like, yeah, I'm going to DJ over here. And he's like, I'm mm. also a DJ and we mm. talk, talk. So when I get there, who do I meet in the car park? Alf. And Did Alf, you know they were behind it? Yeah, so I knew they yeah. were the ones, but yeah. I mean, I, I had not gone there to look for Alf. Yeah. But when I get there at the car park, Alf is there. And so he's like, oh, you're here for the auditions. Come, 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 come. Ah, so he petitions me, I go in, I do the auditions and I leave. Yeah. And then two weeks later, they call me and they're like, yeah, you've got, yeah, you've, you've got the position. 
Really? Yeah. And, and so you hadn't trained? Uh, so now they started training us there. Mm. Yeah. So when they told me I got the position, we went through like about a month or two of training mm. and then we went on air. And that started your entertainment career? That started my entertainment career. Wait, so now, the DJ started it actually. So when the DJ started, mm. so now here yeah, I'm working three jobs a day. Yeah, because there's humanitarian <laughs> there's law. Human, there's the law work I'm doing. TV. There's, no, there's, there's the law work. Yeah. There's uh, radio. There's radio, yeah. After I finish radio, I go to the club to DJ. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's all these things <laughs> coming together. So, so are three jobs in a day. And then there's TV sporadically. And, yeah, and then TV. So through. Yeah, so TV came in a bit later and I was like, okay, fine, I want to do TV. Uh, then I went and did so many auditions, never got called. And I was like, okay, fine, so maybe TV is not for me. But then, this is what I always tell people, that uh, God will give you what you want when you're ready for it, mm. not when you want it to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so that's been my experience in life. Every yeah. time I wanted something to happen, it yeah. didn't necessarily happen at the time I wanted it to, yeah. but it happened when I was ready yeah. for it. Yeah. And so even TV at that time, I don't think I was ready for TV, mm. even though I wanted it. But by going through all these auditions, at mm. least now people were able to get me on tape and could see. Mm. And so then I was called and I think the first TV show I did was, uh, was a lottery show on TV. Mm. I had no TV experience prior to that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm the kind of person who, um, I'm, I'm a go-getter. When I want something, I just go and do it. Mm. And sometimes I go and do it without even thinking about it. Mm. So it hit me that I'm going to be on national TV doing a show the day we aired the first show. So we'd been doing rehearsals before that. Yeah. You know, you're in rehearsals, you can mess up and you can, you yeah. know, take it again, take it again. And it was live. The, the, the actual TV show was live. Wow. So the rehearsals, of course, we did rehearsals yeah. for like about three or four weeks before the actual show yeah. aired. Yeah. The night when the show was airing and yeah. I'm standing there in the in on the set yeah. and there are people all around me yeah. and they're counting it down saying 10, nine eight is when it hit me oh my god i'm about to, I'm go, about to go and live on national tv and, and other people <laughs> have the benefit of starting in a recorded in, yeah format. yeah pre-recorded formats going, i'm like going. oh my god it's gonna be live but then i told myself um even if i mess up this is this is this is how i think even if i mess up i'll only mess up once mm. and then I can't, it can't get worse than that. It mm. can only get better. Yeah. And so, yeah, we killed it. And I did the show for about two years. It went really well. Yeah, it went really well. Did the show for about two years. And then, yeah, after that, uh, it, was, it, it, it was so funny. So then I was still working on radio at the time. And then this show came to an end. And I was thinking, so how do I, how do I get back on TV? I'm not too sure about it. And so, again, God works in mysterious ways. Shafi Weru was doing a show with Betty Chalo on K24. Mm. And Shafi was one of the contributors on Betty Chalo's show. Now, for some reason or the other, Shafi never used to show up. So he'd call me and be like, wait, go cover for me and, and, and do the show, right? So I'd be like, cool. He'd be like, yeah, I'm in costume. I'm seeing a gig. I can't come. You go and cover for me. So I'd be like, cool. So I go and cover. <laughs> and so that's how I started getting onto to, to, to K24. So it was Betty, uh, Valentine Joroge, uh, Shafi Weru, and then I would come to cover Shafi once in a while. Mm. And then once uh, Betty Chalo and that whole crew of people left K24, Valentine Joroge went and pitched a show to K24 and then said, Guess who I want to co host with? Mike. Mike. Yeah. Because you had built a rapport. Because they built a rapport, plus I also went to primary school with her. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. That's it's like, yeah, I know this guy. So yeah, and that's how now I found myself doing the show that I do on Fridays. And you still are able to balance all I'm this. still I'm still able to balance it. That's lovely, man. Yeah. That's lovely. Yeah. And then recently, um, after a span of over a decade yeah. at Homeboys, mm. you switched to, to Smooth, Smooth FM. FM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I saw your tweet and you're picking up um, um, the Rabah brothers, yeah. um, G Money, yeah. and your colleagues yeah. um, at the show. Yeah. Was it an emotional moment? Yeah, I think it was an. And what drove the decision? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it was okay. So, the, what drove the decision was a couple of things. One is because the direction the station was going, it was looking for very young voices and it was looking for a more youthful look. And so, um, I think the decision was made that they wanted to keep the younger presenters while they transition 
some of the other more experienced presenters mm. to the other stations that the Radio Africa group mm. had. Mm. And so, and for, because Homeboys focuses on 18 to 24 male. Mm. So at the age where I am now, I was like, that kind of content is mm. not necessarily where I'm at mm. in life. Mm. So let me look for another platform where mm. I can go and talk about things that are mm. more relevant mm. for people who are my age. Mm. And so Smooth FM was a good transition for me. Mm. And anyway, there are all those stations are on the same floor. Yeah. So <laughs> I, same family. Yeah, same family. So same guys, I, I got to see yeah. all these guys every day. Yeah. But I mean, it was, it was a bit emotional because myself and G Money, I think, were at that time the only original presenters who began with Homeboys in 2007. Mm. I think now G is the only... only uh, he's one remaining, he's, he's yeah. the last man standing. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Corinne? Yeah, and, Co yeah, and Corinne. So G Money, myself, and Corinne. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> For a long time, mm. um, and I follow you closely, um, you've pushed, you've used your social pre presence mm. to push a strong narrative mm. against misogyny, yeah. against patriarchy, mm. and through this um because i remember even how we were raised mm. like the role of a father right. even when they came into like a room mm. like it was just pin drop silence yeah. people are just sitting upright yeah or you run the, away like the you, tv is there yeah. it's like there's a level of tension mm. um around the role of like the presence of our dads in, right. in, the, in the family right. and i've seen your relationship with jason yeah uh, what do you think is the role of new age parents mm. um in forging paths for their kids for moving their kids. forward no, I, th I think it's important you see one of the reasons why i think we have a crisis of masculinity in this country nowadays is because of the way we were raised and you and, you, and you're right around the issue of patriarchy so men were raised to, as bo from boys to men to believe that we are protectors, providers, managers of resources and decision makers. Mm. And while that was true back in the day because of the environment that we're living in, mm. you know, you're living in a space where, in, in a time where a clan could come, a warring clan could come from the neighboring mm. village mm. and, you know, plunder and steal and take mm. everything. So you mm. had to be a protector, yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you were physically strong, you could yeah. fight. Yeah. And then you had to be a provider because how are you also getting your resources? You are going you to that to same village and to, plunder. To, and to plunder and bring <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah. And so because you brought back the resources, you were the decision maker yeah. around how resources were used. Yeah. And because you were away while you were doing all that, your wife was the one taking care of the homestead and the yeah, children. So it, yeah. it, it, it naturally made sense that then, women would stay home and take care of you know, the home yeah. while men were out there doing whatever they were doing. Yeah. But now we're in a day and age where there's no warring clan coming. Yeah. There is no, you know, and women are more empowered. Ed they've got voice power and agency. Education, yeah. And they've got the education. And so men are now finding themselves a bit lost in terms of where do I fit in? And I've been told that these are the roles that I should play, yet my partner is capable of doing all that on her own. By herself. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why you hear people saying things like, You know, which is, cause, which is cause, sad. Yeah, yeah. which is sad because you, you are raised to believe that you, you're more dominant because of these roles you play. Yeah. But now women are able to play all those roles and they don't necessarily Probably need you. Better. <laughs> Probably better. Yeah. So we, we are now, move, we are now in, a, in, a, in an age where we're not looking at competition or dominance. We're looking at partnerships. Yeah. Where we're saying, you bring something to the table, I bring something to the table. Yeah. If you can't cook, but you can clean, I can cook and you clean and vice versa. You know, mm. so it's a partnership. Mm. Yeah. And a lot of men are struggling to find, to understand that it's a partnership. Mm. And that women are advancing at a very fast rate. Mm, while that, men yeah. are sort of stagnated here. Or even tipping. Yeah, over, and if, yeah. exactly. So we, we, we're kind of stagnated here and uh, a lot of men are thinking that uh, the empowerment of women should stop or women should be brought back down to this level and so that men are a bit higher and can now dominate again. Mm. But that's not going to happen. Mm. Women are still going to continue advancing. Mm. So unless we as men see that and begin to nurture boys, to be able to understand they are living in a day and age where there's equity and equality mm. and we're moving towards partnerships and relationships, mm. boys will and men will still continue suffering. Mm. So what's the role of fathers then? I think the role of fathers is to first understand that and then build a relationship with your children, which is very important. A lot of our parents didn't have relationships with us. Mm. It was authoritative. It was mm. you do. 
go stop doing how much mm. did you get in your exams mm. have you done your homework mm. who was that you were playing with mm. and then discipline yeah so that that was our relationship with our parents yeah. but now the kind of relationship like i have with my son is one where we can talk about anything mm. you know i believe my role in his life is to prepare him for this world mm. the school will teach him academics maths mm. english mm. all that mm. my role is to teach him how to engage with this world that's out here how to understand how to become self aware mm. how to understand what his talents are mm. how to turn those talents into skills mm. those skills can then earn him a living mm. but more importantly can help him make a difference in the lives of other people mm. and that's what will give him purpose mm. and once he gets purpose mm. then he's happy and he's fulfilled mm. that's my role as a father mm. yeah and without shaping careers without without with absolutely so my role also is to expose him because so when i understood that i had adhd and i understood what the symptoms of that were mm. i recognize the same I recognize the same things in him mm. so even in school when the teacher tells me that oh you know he's fidgeting in class and all i understand mm. so i'm not going to come and punish him or anything mm. my work will be now understanding that he's struggling with the same things i struggled with mm. is to help him find a way to overcome that struggle mm. and not look at it as a disability mm. so how can i help him understand or find a way he can focus a bit better mm. be a bit better at planning mm be a bit less fidgety mm. so it's my it's my job to give him those tools mm. so that's what i that's what i'm saying when i talk about preparing him mm. to be self aware mm. and also preparing him for the world yeah and and to connect that because we are seeing a world right now mm. where if we looked back 10 years ago mm. and someone said um even look at all the interviews mm. from ceos look mm. at all um the people we idolized mm. um around the world mm. and what they were able to accomplish they all pushed a narrative that meant we should work 60 80 hours mm. a week mm. we should push ourselves we mm. should always even as men mm. um like always fight to be at the top mm. and it 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 revolves around the concept of uh, meritocracy mm. and even entrepreneurs like Elon Musk mm. right now mm. in a world that we exist in right now would push such a narrative mm. but you'd see a lot of cringing faces mm. you'd see people who are now trying to see what's a balance of mm. a quality life mm. and offering value to the world mm. in a way that you get value back mm. and you are a humanitarian um lawyer mm. and your work is to um fight for dignified human lives mm. what's a link between being mentally stable mm. and healthy enough to mm. earn a living mm. and the type of work you're doing i think it's it's it, it it all boils down to your why why are you doing what you're doing why are you working 80 90 100 hours a week you know what are you trying to achieve what is it you trying to achieve and if you look if you peel all those layers and look back you find people are either trying to prove something to either themselves or to their families or to their parents you know that they can be successful and that is then what becomes the idea of success working yourself to almost to the point where you're passing out mm. and you have no time for your own personal development because mm. you're grinding 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 you know we have now this this hustler mm. narrative yeah mm. that, you know me I'm me I'll hustle mm. I'm there for the hustle but why are you hustling mm. you know and then when is enough when is it enough Yeah. You know, so we don't we don't have we don't talk about that balance. And I'll take it again back to parenting because when we were kids and you're asked by your parents, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you say innocently say, I want to be a bus driver. I want to be a police officer. And your parents would need to tell you, no, 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 no. If police officers are corrupt people, they're people who failed in school, they're they you know, they're not good people. If you become a police officer you'll never live a good life look at how these guys are living you know so and they they actually extended that <coughs> to even dignified um courses or units or professions like if you say you want to be a journalist yeah. they'll be like okay so you want to fight for the eight sports yeah and Ex- ex- exactly so beyond so, that yeah so so uh, so when your parents are telling you all those things what they're planting in your mind 
is that success is material. Success means I have to get a good job, earn money, live in a certain neighborhood, marry a certain type of person, into a certain type of family, take my kids to a certain type of school, and then I'll be happy. Mm. And so you strive to achieve all that, and that's why now you're working 80, 90 hours a week because you're like, my, you know, you're either studying that much because I want to be an engineer, a pilot, or a doctor, because mm. they told those are the only courses that you can <laughs> yeah. do. And then I have to live in Runda. I have to drive a certain kind of car. I have to marry a certain... So you're trying to achieve all these milestones and then you achieve them and then you realize I'm, I'm still not happy. Mm. You know? And then you start asking yourself, what's missing? And what's missing is the fact that you're doing all these things because other people told you that this is what was right for you. Mm. You are not self-aware to understand what it is that you naturally do well mm. and build on that. And then use that to better the world around you. Mm. Because, Akira, I'll tell you, if you're using your skills and talents to make a difference in the lives of other people, there's nothing more fulfilling than that. There's no check anyone will ever write you, mm. whether it's a million shillings or whatever, that will give you the sense of fulfillment you have when you use your talents and you can see you've transformed somebody's life. And that's what drove me even to do the work I do with um, around issues of women's rights and human rights. The issues of inequality, the issues of discrimination. My belief that everybody was put on this earth to thrive. When God put you on this earth, he gave you specific talents, because he knew those talents are what are going to enable you to thrive on this planet. For somebody else to come and try and introduce an environment that limits your thriving, limits your potential. your potential, your exercise of your, you know, your, your talents. And, that, and not living a dignified, a dignified life. life. So yeah. for me, that really asked me and I was like, I must try and use all the platforms that I have to reduce, reverse and completely eradicate that. Because mm. all of us are here to thrive. Mm. Yeah, and it goes down to the basic needs. Yes, having water, yeah, shelter, exactly, food. Yeah, so that you can use that as a foundation. Yeah, that tomorrow you can build on. But yeah. if those are not there, yeah. then, then, then then you can't. I mean, you know, so everybody everybody has a right to those basic things, you know, and so for me, you cannot thrive if you have no water in your house. Mm. You know, you have no electricity. Your kids are not going to school. You can't put food on the table. So if we create an environment where everybody is able to meet those basic needs, mm. then from there, we can all thrive, mm. you know? Mm. And it's, it's, it's sad for me to see we live in a country and in a time where there are certain powers that very deliberately make sure that a majority of the population never achieve that standard of living where your basic needs are met. And so that's why for me, I, I, I really believe in the work that I do in trying to reverse all these inequalities, in trying to ensure that people are empowered enough to be self-aware and understand their worth, mm. but also giving them the tools, the knowledge, and um, you know, the capacity to be able to just thrive and you know, look for things that they can do that are meaningful to them, but also make a difference in the world. Mm. There, there must be moments in your life when things just didn't add up. Because mm. right now, we, we are seeing consistency. We are right. seeing 13, 17 years yeah. of work put in yeah. of a beautiful child mm. um, raised really well. Mm. But I'm sure there are those moments when things just didn't add up mm. and you're like, you know what? Mm. Like, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm done. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's not all, it's, it's not all a bit of roses, but I think for me, when, when those moments come, and they do come, especially if you are pioneering and you're doing things that not many other people are doing. Because when I started doing all these multiple things where I was juggling all these different jobs, I don't know anybody else who was doing that at that point. And I remember so many people would try and discourage me. Like, you're a lawyer. No, stick to law. Don't, you can't be a lawyer and then a DJ at night and then you're emceeing and then you're on radio and you're on TV. And they're like, no, you can't do that. And I was like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> I can't. It's... You can't. <laughs> you know, so you deal with that. But I mean, the, of course, there are times where, I, I, you know, I sat and I asked myself, what, what, what am I doing? And then 
when times become hard like that, again, you have to revisit your why. And if your why is not strong, if your why, why you're doing this is because your dad told you or your partner is giving you pressure to do it or society expects you to do it. If your why is not strong, you'll crumble. But if your why is strong, for me, my why has always been, and, and, and I tell you what my why is, and I, I tell this to everybody. The day I meet God, inshallah, the day I meet God, inshallah. and God asks me, Mike, I gave you all this talent. I gave you this, I gave you this, I gave you this. What did you do with it? Can you imagine standing there in front of your maker and saying, God, I know you gave me all these things, but I was afraid to do it because of what my neighbors would think, because of what my girlfriend would think, because of what my parents would think. It, Can you imagine? It ends up looking very... Uh, yeah. Can you imagine meeting God and giving that excuse? I was afraid to do it because of what people would think. And he says, I gave you all these talents. You did nothing with them. That's my why. That's I'm like, I'm afraid to meet my maker and give a flimsy excuse like that. I want to be able to meet my maker and say, God, you gave me all these things. And yes, this is what I did with them. That's powerful. Yeah. And, and through that, um, let's hope you live... I pray that you live a long life before that happens. <laughs> I hope so too. Yeah. yeah. And when that happens, you'd have left a son, yes. hopefully, yeah. um, who's supposed to thrive well, yeah. be, well beyond yeah. um, what you've been able to achieve. Absolutely. And there's work around humanitarian law mm. and you being a humanitarian champion mm. that you'd have loved to have accomplished mm. by that time. Yeah. What would you look back and say, Okay, so this is my legacy. Mm. This is what I've achieved, mm. and I'm peaceful um, with that. My my legacy, even and the work that I do with all the platforms that I'm on, is um, I want people to realize that the only thing that can limit them is themselves, and that they should become more self-aware by having moments where they sit and ask themselves. What are these things that are holding me back? And realize that you are born on this earth, and when you are born on this earth, you are born here, you are put here to thrive. And that there are so many things that we learn along the way that limit our capacity to do that. It could be religion, it could be socialization, it could be you know just expectations from people around us. There are a lot of things that limit us. And once we understand what are those things that limit us and shake them off and realize that you're here on this earth by yourself to live the best life that you can live uh, as purposefully as you can. If I can leave this earth knowing that everybody I've interacted with has that understanding, then that will be my legacy. That people were able to shake off all these inhibitions and all these things that are chaining them and they were able to find what their true purpose is and live it. I, I really love that. Mm -hmm. And just as a parting shot, and very well connected with that, because you've mentioned you've struggled with ADHD. Yeah. I relate with you because okay. I was recently diagnosed yeah. with ADHD yeah. at 32 years mm. um, of life. And mm. it's put a lot of perspective mm. looking back. Mm. I look back and I, and I finally understand when those questions were asked, mm. Akil, are you even listening? Yeah. Um, you he have doesn't so pay much attention potential. in class. Yeah. There's so much potential. Yeah. All these things are happening around you. Um, you're a waste of potential. You yeah. need to work harder. You mm. need... And now I sit back and I realize, okay, so because of my condition mm. and it's mental health at the end, end of the day, mm. it, I was lucky enough and life pushed me, mm. even without understanding it, mm. it pushed me to a direction of purpose where I can, I can fully apply myself mm. and fully focus mm. on the creative aspects of my life. Absolutely. Now, there are so many people out there who are struggling with mental health conditions, mm. trying to find their voice mm. and space within this mm. larger, especially digital economy where yeah. everything you do is amplified to a larger audience. Mm. What would be your advice to them? Okay. Uh, in, in terms of uh, mental health, I think for me, I just want to tell people, for those who are struggling like, with ADHD, for me, it's not a disability. ADHD is a superpower. 
if you know how to turn it into a, it's a superpower. That's why most people look at me and ask me, Mike, how can you do all these things? And I'm like, my ADHD is a superpower. <laughs> it's yeah. literally a superpower. Because yeah. I can keep going 24 hours a day without getting tired. Yeah. You know, because I've tapped into something in me. Mm. Everybody else looked at as a disability. Mm. But for me, it fuels me and drives me. Mm. And I'm sure even you are able to do more. Mm. Like from here, you go and do something else yeah. and something else and something yeah. else. Yeah. And somebody who doesn't have that ability, because for me, it's an ability. Somebody mm. who doesn't have that ability can understand what you're doing. Mm. And so... For me, is, is no, don't let the labels that are in this world determine mm. who you are and how you think about yourself. Mm. So it's up to you to sit quietly, try and understand who you are and the things that you can do, mm. and then apply those. Mm. Never mind if no one understands what you're doing. Mm. It doesn't matter. Mm. This is your journey. It's not theirs. Mm. So they can sit on the sidelines and watch and wave mm. or they can join you. Mm. It's, it's that simple. Yeah. No one, they don't have to understand what you're doing and yeah. it's okay. Yeah. It's not their journey, it's yours. Yeah. 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 And when it gets too tough, you yeah. can get help. When it, when it Therapy gets too, ab works. Ab absolutely. Talk to friends. Yeah, absolutely. Let absolutely. people know, yeah. communicate. Yeah, yeah. because it, 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 it will get difficult. It will get difficult. So, my my thing is surround yourself with people who think like you you know so that then when you're also talking about your struggles mm. you can find an answer in how they have also dealt with the mm. same struggles mm. you know mm. because for, for people who are creatives if you're talking to a non-creative about some of the struggles you go through they won't understand mm. you know then you start hearing things like focus and you know yeah. start trying to work harder you know? so they're going to tell you yeah. Yeah, they're going to tell you very unhelpful things mm. so surround yourself with people who think like you mm. and it doesn't have to be 20 people it mm. could be two or three people and that's fine mm. yeah but you must protect your energy and you must be around people who also encourage you mm. and motivate you to be, be to, to be the best version of yourself mm. yeah i love that mm. i completely love that yeah. and to celebrate you today um, as a father, because yeah. um, you've been doing a lot of fathering, yeah. you've been doing, you've been celebrating your kid. Yeah. Um, I think um, through Junction, um, yeah. the mall, yeah. um, we I wanted to find a way to gift you yeah. this Father's Day. Yeah. And I'm trying to have this conversation <laughs> with you. Yeah. We're trying to visualize yeah. what I would be able to get you. Yeah. So I think we'll just walk around the mall. Okay. Um, we'd have the conversation further yeah. and I think I'll be able to figure something out yeah. with the Junction Mall as our sponsors okay. today. Okay, absolutely man. I love being at the Junction. It's a fantastic place. Super. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cheers. All right. Flex. We can start working out. Yeah. Flex. I have money. Yeah. 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 Money. And I have someone here called Jason who's going to help me choose a cologne for Mike, the dad. Jason, are you ready? Yes. We can go in. Choose. You ready? Yeah. Completely. Let's go. Okay, let's go. It's Jason's gift to his dad for Father's yeah. Day. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yes. So I can show you a few options. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much Thank as well. So yeah. Okay. Here we go. This is nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, coming in.